Hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are. Thanks for joining us again. We love hearing where you're from, so make sure you give us a big shout out there. Hey, I see Robert and London, Pakistan. How do you, how are you from, you're both from London and Pakistan. Okay, not, not a bad choice of places. Windy City, Maryland. We're going to dive right in here in a second. We've got a very special guest I want to introduce you to, but first... I do want to mention that this show is sponsored by our friends at Bay Photo, and here are some of their specials. I mentioned this the other day. They've got this 30% off on the Exposer, which is a really cool way to make a print that actually hangs on the wall, that kind of floats on the wall. That's what I use as my background behind me. And we always talk about making books, so they've got a 30% off on making books right here. So you know what? Do yourself a favor. Make something. Make a print. Don't just have these digital things floating around in the universe. Make a print. Make a book. Make one of these cool exposers and you'll get 30% off. And if you've never placed a first order, your first order is 25% off. So go for it. Okay. All right. Now our guest today is somebody I interviewed. We look back it's like been almost 10 years ago it's awesome to have him back with us uh he's a remarkable photographer in terms of his quality and utter range of work he has two national at least two national geographic covers that i've seen maybe more he was a new york times photographer for six years pulitzer prize winner he's earned numerous other awards and in 2008 he did something. He turned filmmaking on its head by shooting a film with a Canon 5D Mark II, which most of us at that time were clueless that a DSL, DSLR could do that. So he opened the door to a whole new breed of filmmakers, including myself. He's gone on to direct numerous films, and I'm really happy to have Vincent Laferre back with us again. Welcome back to the show, Vincent. Hey, Mark. Hey, guys. Hey, everybody. Uh, I can't believe it's been nine years. It's a little bit yeah. scary. <laughs> we'll blink again. It'll be nine more years before we know it. So, <laughs> you know, I asked you this question or something similar to it back then. I'm just going to re-ask you. Uh, when it comes to photography, because you're doing a lot more than just still photography, but when it comes to photography, what is it that really drives you uh telling a story uh sounds like a hackneyed thing to say but generally you're trying to share something that you have witnessed uh or that you're creating um you want to share the beauty of it you want to share the idea of it or the emotion of it so you know generally the story emotion or beauty are the three drivers for me or the emotion let's talk about emotion specifically and mm -hmm. we might want to, do, why don't we just go to some of your images that you feel are a good representation of emotion and talk about how you got in there. How did you, how did you pull the emotion out of the subject or find it or create it or whatever you did? Mm -hmm. So Jared will move anywhere you want on your website and we'll just pull up something and talk about it. All right. Putting me on the spot. Um, Let's see. Um, well, we'll go to somewhere that's not obvious. Go to Project Air. Okay. And uh, I'll just show you some new work. And um, we can just go to these images right here. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing this on purpose because this is very technical photography. Um, yet, even though it's just a picture of buildings or of a cityscape, um, it makes me feel energy. Yeah. Uh, it makes me feel movement which is, um, you know, almost an oxymoron. That's not the right use of it, but it's, it's anti, uh, it's counterintuitive yeah. to motion from the air because of it, you know, technically, you know, if anyone's been in a helicopter, you're always told to shoot at a very high shutter speed to freeze motion because the helicopter has been described as 100,000 pieces of metal trying to shake themselves loose from one another. <laughs> it's not the most stable platform. It's a very jittery, loud platform, whereas... Yeah. I feel in the air when I'm in the air. People always say, aren't you scared? So I'm more scared standing on my terrace, you know, 
uh, one story or any terrace one or two stories above the ground at the edge, even though, you know, there might be something that comes up to my hip, I don't feel comfortable getting too close. Yet when I'm in a helicopter uh, sitting on the side, you know, the door open and a harness on, I feel like I'm on a magic carpet. I feel a tremendous sense of freedom uh, and happiness and energy yeah. coming from the city. And, you know, I thought I'd throw you for a little bit for, you know, a, a curveball here by showing you this when I'm talking about emotion. Yeah. Because when I look at these images, I feel something. And that's the goal. It doesn't, photography, the beauty of photography is it doesn't have to be too complicated. It can be very complex and very thought through. So, you know, if you, uh, if you look at work of like Dan Winter, who builds his own sets and photographs stars, you know, it's a very thought through process. Yeah. Uh, and Taylor's on, actually Taylor is or was on the show, Taylor Jones, who works with Dan. So, you know, he could speak to that about how, you know, thought through that process is Dan will, you know, build things literally, whether they're, you know, props or sets. Whereas the beauty of photography is you can just pick up a camera right now and walk outside and go film or shoot something. Uh, and um, generally speaking, something's going to cause you to trigger that camera. To mm -hmm. capture that moment and we don't always know what it is sometimes we have a very purposeful uh act that we're doing we're trying to take a portrait we're trying to capture a landscape uh we're doing some photojournalism and trying to tell a news story so if you go ahead and you click on photojournalism for example jared and you look at um you know katrina the emotion here just exists in the scene um, you know, as a photojournalist, uh, you have to find moments like this yeah. you know, that have a lot of natural emotion. But the truth is, this would be happening whether or not I was there, which is true about anything in photography, I guess. But to a certain degree, a, a photojournalist is a witness and a witness that brings back, you know, what's going on somewhere in the world that people either can't see or don't want to see. Absolutely. And and what? Which one was the one you won the uh, Pulitzer for? That was 9-11. You go to photojournalism and you go to Pakistan. Uh, wow. I was part of a, a group of photographers that covered basically, you know, I mean, for example, the first image there, Jared, uh, yeah. that's not a portrait. That's, you know, that's me on stage with, um, I think, about 10,000 people in the audience um, with a mullah screaming, you know, kill Bush, kill Americans. And here we are with his security detail, you know, sitting while he's at the podium and I made this portrait. That's a very real emotion. I don't think this guy was um, channeling much warmth towards me. No. no. <laughs> I was very glad that I was very visible to a lot of people at that moment because I felt that if I had met this guy, you know, somewhere else in a more remote location, my fate may not have found the same outcome, you know? Yeah. So... You know, this is during war, right, or the start of a war. So very, very different. Or the next image is um, of a young girl uh, who left Afghanistan. This is her new home, which is you know, literally a wall made of mud uh, in the middle of a dirt, you know, uh, uh, acre or 10 acres of dirt, basically. And a um, very interesting moment where when we pulled up, you know, we were the typical Western photographers with cameras and all the kids were jumping around me. Let's see out of a movie, and then suddenly, after a minute or two, I I, I locked eyes with her, and this this is what happened. Everything, everything stopped, and uh, you know this is where photojournalism and photography has a very I think unique power in that when you look at this image, or when I look at this image, I ask myself, what's her story? You know, what is she feeling? How did she end up here? And um, I didn't write anything about it. We don't know, but it, it engages the viewer, hopefully, into asking those questions. One of the things, you know, when we talked back when, uh, nine years ago, you talked about don't, don't use your camera right away. Go out and look around the scene, talk to the people, get a feel for it before you start making photographs. And can you can you kind of refresh people on that on your approach? Because we were just actually talking about that recently. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I think the secret to me that I try to teach um, or share with other photographers that ask me ask me about my process is what I tell them is it's less about the pictures you take and more about the pictures you don't take. And oh, what yes. I mean by that is when you show up on a scene, um, 
whether it's a news story or whether it's a landscape that's not really moving anywhere anytime soon other than the sun setting. Right. Um, sometimes you have to, if, you, if you're caught by something, you have to react and just start shooting what you see immediately in front of you. But I, I find that my best work, unless there's something really extraordinary that got me there in the first place, which I'm trying to say, you don't ignore that. You know, so if you're driving in a car or riding on a bike or walking and something catches your yeah. eye, go ahead and, and capture that. You know, because that's probably the reason you stopped. But don't dismiss it entirely. But once you've captured that, try to move on. And, you know, as a photographer, I almost go through a set pattern of things to think about and look about. And what I do is I move around and I think about what the image is. Sometimes I give myself time. And the original thought I was trying to share is try to avoid getting so locked into taking pictures that you're no longer looking around. It's too easy to get in tunnel vision. And more importantly, it's too easy to obsess on what I would call mediocre or predictable photos versus really taking the time to look around and absorb what really makes it unique. And to me, it's almost an intellectual discussion within myself as much as a process because I'm constantly asking myself, what makes this situation unique? What is special here? that I need to capture. And then once I found that, I'll go through my process of trying to capture it as best I can. You know, you were talking about uh, fear of heights and getting over that and, and you know, how you're comfortable in a helicopter. It has come up uh, in our recent surveys that some photographers, believe it or not, are uncomfortable getting into these kinds of situations, especially street photography. How did you overcome that? Or did you have to? Or was it just a natural thing for you? I think you have to accept who you are as a human being. And you have to either tackle your fears or accept them. That's your personal choice. Uh, I started doing street photography when I was 15. And I, I found it interesting, especially in New York, because people will beat you up if you take their pictures or they give you really nasty players. You have to build up a self-defense. And you, you emit a certain aura when you're photographing. If you're doing it for the right reason and you feel confident in what you're doing, you'll find that most people accept you or um, let you do it. And if you have to have a conversation about it, go ahead. But some people admit you know, it's really bad energy because they're so anxious themselves or uncomfortable. And if you're, it's like you know, being out in the wild. If, if your prey or if the person you're photographing senses something, they will attack you in yeah. self-defense. So... To your original question, you know, everyone has different comfort levels. I have no problem going in the middle of a mob, photographing. However, you put me in a room with a star um, that, you know, gives me 30 seconds to make a photo, I find that highly uncomfortable. I'm not intimidated by stars or celebrities, but I hate having an artificial deadline set on me to be creative. Yeah. So, you know, usually if you guys ever do celebrity photography or CEOs, you're literally told you have between... 30 seconds to maybe five minutes right. sometimes it's three sometimes it's 90 seconds and you're not kidding like at 90 they're walking off and that's not something that's very you know uh fulfilling for me so i've never gravitated towards those whereas some other people will love you know portraiture and hate photojournalism so see what you find interesting or or see the you know challenge yourself to tackle the ones that you find uncomfortable yeah, I think that's good. And pushing, in any case, pushing past your comfort zone is a good thing because mm -hmm. otherwise, as you said, you're just going to keep taking the same images again. And your advice, let's, I, I like to drill down into that because you mentioned this before. It's not about the images you take, but the ones you don't take. Can you sure. kind of tell yeah. me a little so, bit more about Jared, that? Why don't you jump into collections and go into any of those? Um, and I think... I think it's a very important thing. So, you know, this um, uh, this image here speaks directly to what you take and what you don't take. Uh, this image of the horses running up the hill, uh, that was a, about a five to ten minute period in the entire day where the sun came out, right? So wow. for the entire almost ten hours I was waiting there, it was torrential downpour the entire day. And, you know, you can definitely work a scene when there's rain, but I knew the client wasn't going to use a rainy shot. It was for a positive launch of a camera, right? So instead of wasting my energy all day shooting in circles, um, 
around rain, which sometimes you need to do, and sometimes you'll discover some great imagery for sure. I just knew because again, I'm thinking about this that my client's never going to use that. Yeah. So I just rested and I waited and I sat down with them indoors out of the rain and we we chatted and we bonded right as human beings. So that when this glimpse of light came through, literally for less than 10 minutes in the entire day, we knew exactly where to go and what to do. We had a plan. And I said, well, the moment we find some sun or light, let's go right towards it. And when we saw this, I said, listen, guys, go up that hill and I'm going to go down, you know, stay here with a long lens and I'm going to try to superimpose you with a setting sun, right? And uh, we had a plan. And the point is, I didn't waste my energy all day. If you go to the next image, you know. Um, this is uh, the, the Paniolo Cowboy uh, story in Hawaii, um, and you can keep going. You know, the, the, the horse was the, the first frame I made when the sun came out, right? It's a gorgeous right. color, but it took discipline to wait that out. Uh, sometimes you have to work it. Sometimes you need to push further and discover something completely new, but sometimes you know what your deliverable is, you know, which is my fancy way to say, you know, deliverable is what you deliver to the client. Yeah. And... Um, this is the launch of the 60D or something, really, really way back in the day. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we had, you don't ever go shoot a commercial job in Hawaii in January. It's suicidal because it rains almost every single day. So you end up sitting on your hands waiting. But it's worth it because when the sun does come out, these colors are so, you know, the, the, the ground is so rich from yeah. all the fall. And the colors are so spectacular that... Um, it rewards you. So back to your original question, when you're looking around, so I'll tackle it a different way. I can't tell you how often I see people jump out of cars and start shooting the most random stuff. Yeah. And I ask myself, and I literally so often said, like, what in the world are they shooting? Because I can look up five degrees to the left or 10 degrees up and go, there's an amazing tree there or there's an amazing juxtaposition of geometry or look at the light that's screaming off the sky and this guy's shooting his shoes. Now, I respect people. I don't walk up to them because it would be incredibly rude to say that. Hey, <laughs> hey dude, point your camera over there. Yeah, for 30 years, I've been taking pictures to make a living and to work for commercial clients, right? So I'm obviously going to have a different approach and see different things. More importantly, I respect a person's right to photograph whatever they want. It's supposed yeah. to be fun. But I can't tell you how often I see people shooting and I go like, literally from like, you know, 100 feet away, just pan to the left a little bit or, or take two steps forward because you do it so often. And what I'm identifying on mine, at least, is how I would approach a subject, right? And trying to, to share that with them, albeit not reality, really showing it to them. But the point is, you're always looking. So even when I'm walking around without a camera, I'm still looking. I'm still enjoying. That's why I use my iPhone a lot. And when I see someone else shooting, you know, as someone who's done a lot of teaching, I have this natural tendency to want to share with them and say, you know, just take a step forward or, you know, go a little wider or Go to the left a little bit because that huge light pole that you have in the back of your frame is killing you, yeah. you know. And um, I guess that's what happens when you're slightly obnoxious and have been doing this for 30 years. But <laughs> you know, at least I don't say that to them openly unless they ask, you know. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, back to the original The idea is if you waste your time on the mediocre image, you're never going to find the great one. And... You know, the rules that I have are very simple. As I've, if I've seen a photograph before that I have shot or someone else has shot, or if I've shot it myself, I move on. Meaning, you know, yeah. once I capture that perfect sunset shot with the sun hitting the horizon, that's just simply composed. I've done that. I check mark that. Right. And the next time I show up to a sunset, I will study the way the sun reflects on the water or the way the light is emitted or something else. Yeah. I'll do it. And, and I think that's how you push yourself is to refuse to repeat yourself. Um, that's very integral to what I do. Like this is tilt shift photography during the Olympics, you know, and the idea was how there's 700 credentialed photographers in the Olympics. How do you stand out? What do you do that's so different? Because you'll find yourself literally surrounded by 100 to 200 photographers to your left and your right. Every single person has the exact same lens and camera. Right. You know, it's either a Nikon or a Canon, and we're all on 400 two eights or whatever it is. And you have to ask yourself, you look at the work of David Burnett, for example, who goes out there with Graflex cameras and film cameras and odd lenses. He looks like a kook to most people or an, an anachronism, 
who has never learned the beauty, you know, the, the, the easiness of digital photography. The reality is he's absolutely kicking everyone's butt because his approach is so different. He knows, he, you know, frankly, I'm sure he'd tell you, he probably can't compete with a lot of the wire and sports illustrator photographers who do nothing but shoot on an 800 millimeter all day. And they are like athletes, right? They are the best of the best in the world. So why compete with those women and gentlemen that, you know, um, like Lucy, uh, uh, Lucy Nicholson from Reuters or Elsa Garrison who shoot sports every single day. I've known Elsa since we were both starting. So 30 years ago, almost every single day she shot sports. So why, if I went to shoot a sporting event tomorrow, would I compete with her? It's foolish. Yeah, I'm not gonna out shoot her with a 400. You know, she she feels that thing like it's you know a glove. So I'm going to pick a different lens or a different angle, and I think it's very important for everyone to try to do that. You know, you may not work in groups, but my rule was always if I had a pile of people around me, or more than one or two people where I was shooting, I would just move. It didn't matter what the image was. It was just an instinctual thing at the New York Times, is if someone else was standing where I was standing, I went somewhere else. Unless it was- makes sense. And you, I believe you were one of the early adopters on the whole uh, tilt shift movement, right? I mean, you kind of started as I recall. Well, it's, you know, you gotta be careful when you say, because you're you're accurate in that, I think in 2006, I was one of the two or three photographers that year, looking back at it, that shot tilt shift at the time. Like, yeah. no one was shooting it. Yeah. But it would be unfair to say we did anything in terms of inventing it because it had been around since forever. And well, sure. It was part of the graphics and the 4x5s. Right. And whatnot. We may have revived it to some degree because like, an anecdote is when I borrow the tilt shift from Canon, I used to be an explorer of light with Canon, which means I could borrow gear uh, from their CPS program back in the day. They had, like shelves full of these lenses and after i did a story on tilt shift that appeared in uh, the new yorker magazine or new york magazine i called to borrow it again the guy's like you did it like they're not here they're all checked out everyone's borrowing them now they used to have a literal you know quarter inch of dust on them because no one ever touched them and now they're all out you know all 50 of them so you know um and that comes out of for me it came out of curiosity um i shot an image of um some jets in Tierdeboro, and I was in the helicopter, and I'd shot the twenty four seventy for so long. I said, "Well, what what would it look like with a tilt shift lens?" And Jared, uh, go back to some of those tilt shifts. You had them earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah. And what? Yeah. So you, I know you just get there's a good one. Yeah, curious. You just get curious and start testing things out. It sounds like. I think you know, everyone's goal should be to become a quote unquote master, to master every single rule. Uh, and, you know, just like a musician knows his or her scales or, uh, you know, a, a, an ice skater knows how to skate first in a straight line, yeah. you master that and you do, you know, jumps and pirouettes, whatever. And then you break every single one of those rules. That's when you start producing exciting work that no one's seen before. Right. You know, stuff I showed you earlier of the long exposures night no one's ever done that to my knowledge, you know, like that. Um, and you don't get there. Some, some of you might get there by being lucky. I've gotten there out of sheer exhaustion in the Olympics where I, I put a wrong setting on my camera. And instead of shooting at a 500th of a second, I'm shooting a fifth of a second. Oh, and I'm getting incredible streaks, you know. And um, next thing you know, the entire row of people, of photographers in the Olympics are shooting at a fifth of a second because it looks cool, right? <laughs> um, but doesn't always come to you as this inspiration if you go to collections again and go to um let's see uh go to urban you know that's that's a little different um you don't always like the next image this is an image of uh, the first one is uh, exactly there you go this is a fisheye lens of new york city yeah. and it's me holding uh, a fisheye lens underneath a skid of the helicopter it's not a very common image you know or it wasn't back then to a large degree because people didn't have access to this lens. And then of course people didn't think to put it at the end of a monopod with some safety cables. And at the time, you know, it was relatively new, this is a digital camera, to be able to plug your camera in via a firewire cable into your laptop. Because if you think about it, you can't compose this image when you're holding the camera, I would say six feet below your feet or your eye. So uh, about six feet lower than where my eye is. Wow. Yeah. Monopod, but I'm able to compose using technology to get an image that's very different looking. 
you know, and that's the sun setting on the Hudson River on top, and that's the Empire State Building in the middle of New York. You know, Vincent, this this one point I think deserves a tremendous amount of um, contemplation and doing by our audience, guys who are who are looking and learning. And that is push yourself beyond anything you've already done and look for new ways to capture it. And that just sounds like that's just a rule that's that's kind of emblazoned in your forehead. So you're never going to plagiarize yourself and just shoot the same thing that you or somebody else shot. So you're either looking at a new angle or a new way of capturing it or, you know, that sounds like that's in your DNA, which I think is fantastic. I think it comes from my father and my upbringing. You know, he was the one that would say things like, uh, there's a very Latin spirit. I'm French uh, and a U.S., you know, and an American. I'm both. And But my, my family, my mother and my father are French. And I would go see my father who's always lived in France. And he would tell me, you're far too American. This is when I was 15. And he's <laughs> like, what do you mean? He's like, you follow the rules. You know, you do everything they tell you to do. And he's like, in, the, in France, we have this thing called this, the Latin spirit which says that any law is written and it's meant, it's therefore meant to be broken. You know, <laughs> it's it. this kind of anti-establishment way of thinking. And in fact, I mean, I can tell you the whole story. He's like, you know, I want you to, he said, I want you to go into this uh, grocery store and I want you to steal something. I'm like, what? what? He's like, no, you need to learn how to steal and you need to learn how the psychology of doing that and controlling your emotions and getting away with it. And you need to learn what that feels like and, you know, see if you can get away with it. And here I was, this, you know, I think I was 13 or 12 and, you know, sweating and going to steal a, I don't know what I still don't remember. And I came out of the store having succeeded in my mission. He's like, okay, good. Well, that was the easy part. Now you got to go get it. You got to go put it back without getting caught. That's the really hard part now that you're guilty. And I did. And, you know, the next thing was all right, um, I want you to go into this concert venue and go to the front of the stage and photograph. Uh, the one key is you have no credential and you're 16 years old. Go for it. Wow. And we talk about the psychiatry of getting past a security guard. And he's like, well, <laughs> you have to. You can't walk too slowly because I'll take interest in you. You absolutely can't make eye contact for longer than a quarter second. So, you know, what you don't want to do is you don't want to look away because then the guard will take interest in you. You don't want to walk too fast because they think they're going to try to get past them. You yeah. don't want to walk too slow because they'll think you have doubt. You have to walk at the exact right pace that states, I've got somewhere to go, I belong here, and I need to go do something. The Jedi and Knight? Quick, yeah, it was literally like teaching me to be a Jedi Knight. Just You've got to make a quick move. eye contact as in you have to acknowledge them, but you have to believe in that this is your purpose You've got work to do. And if they stop you, you have to say, I'm just going to go, you know, I'm, I'm going to the front of stage and just keep going. And if they really stop you, just you ask you where your credential is, you have to react so shocked at, what do you mean, where's my credential? I look around for it, come and say, oh, it's back there. I'll be right back. You know, and not give in to getting caught. And I showed up on the front of uh, a Rolling Stones concert um, and photographed Keith Richards uh, from, you know, the front row. I snuck into the U.S. Open tennis for three years straight via the player's entrance and photographed it. So, and that's all from my father. Just that's saying, really amazing coaching from your dad. Far too much. And uh, he's not a criminal. Um, you know, he got, my favorite story from him is he got pulled over by a cop uh, for burning a red light. And he said to the cop, are you sure? Just, and just, the cop, you know, is giving red light tickets all day, was so put off by this guy's, you know, daring and also by how could he said, I did not burn a red light. Are you, I, I can tell you, I absolutely did not for sure. Are you sure? And the cop doubted himself and let him go. And my father's laughing his ass off the whole way back. Wow. But that's my dad. So from that comes this refusal to do things the normal way and, and, what I would call an abject refusal to repeat myself. I love it. I just do it. I love it. We could do a whole course out of this, Vincent. I mean, you know, okay, so we'll just repeat those exercises. Go to the store, steal. No, 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 no. Don't steal anything, please. <laughs> but no, those are, those are, 
amazing points. I had no idea. We never talked about this before. It reminds I, me of Cameron Crowe. You know, Cameron Crowe's story I, with Almost Famous when he was 14 or whatever. You guys were the same age. Uh -huh. Busting into, you know, uh, getting, a, getting his gig at the Rolling Stone magazine when they thought he was a grown-up. Same sort of deal. I love it. You're you're learn the rules, break the rules, learn both ways, so you're not inhibited by it. Yeah, I mean, being a photojournalist to me is being a walking psychiatrist or psychologist. You know, you are analyzing people and their emotion. Just looking at your comments from Lorraine Spencer, she said I asked a guy if I could take his picture. First time I did that, turned out I couldn't take it because he was at work and it wasn't allowed. But I got the courage at least, and that's great. You know, go get the courage, build it up. Um, I can't tell you how many interesting people I photographed who say, like, why are you wasting your time? And this is for the New York Times on assignments. Yeah. Why are you wasting your time taking my picture? I do this every day. And I would say, because it's really interesting, and I know to you it's just what you do every day, but to someone else, you know, there's value in what you do, and people find interesting, and I find it interesting. Here's what I find interesting about it. And I said, you know, let's go back to doing what you're doing. Forget I'm here. Don't don't act for me, especially as a photojournalist. I couldn't direct people. I would just say, you know, just go back to doing what you're doing. Forget I'm here, and you know, let me do my job, and you know, trust me. And um, I can't tell you, you know, how uh, many great experiences I have as a result of that, because people do eventually forget you, you, you that you're there. And more importantly, they they sense that aura about you. You've probably noticed some people are really good about being a fly on the wall or being out of the way. My father was a set photographer, which meant he worked on movie sets. Uh -huh. And I started when I was 15 doing that as well. And you're basically the biggest persona non grata on set because you're not a crew member. You don't carry cases. You don't contribute to the film. You're just always in the way. So people really don't want you there. They hate right. the set photographer. And you have to find a way to ingratiate yourself to get the images that they're ultimately going to use, you know, in the magazine or on the poster to promote the film. And it's a very interesting psychological e exercise. And you're truly not wanted. You're, you're a pain in the butt. And I'm now a director, and I see set photographers. And I understand for the first time, and this is like it's been 10 years now, but the last thing I need is one more X factor. I don't need someone walking on my set, getting in the way, tripping on something, distracting someone. Yeah. Because I have so much stress and stuff that I, I'm controlling. You know, I've got 60 crew members and I've got five or 10 actors uh, or other things I'm trying to control that I can't. I don't need more X factors, but of course I, I treat them as well as I can because I started off doing that. You know, and I'm like, just go do your job. Just don't stand here or there and stay don't out. Trip of over any cables. Yeah, and they know that and uh, they appreciate it. You know, and I'll go out of my way to say, do you need something? Can I do something to help you? And they're like, what? <laughs> You're asking me if you can do something to help my job? No one asks that. I'm like, and I tell them where I came from. They're like, oh, well, that's pretty special. That's cool. Yeah, I'd love to get this if you can give me 30 seconds. I'm like, absolutely. You know, so. You had a great back. mentor. I think that's fantastic. And your dad. And I did. we all could use somebody to push us into those, you know, past our, our comfort level for sure. Well, there's, there's more stories. So, uh, Jared, you can go into the Apple Inc. work um, and just kind of cycle through that. But, um, you know, I think it's just one image on that one. I can't show too much stuff that I shoot for Apple. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, one of them may be over my left shoulder. Um, if you look carefully, that's all I'll say. I'm going to move, um, you, move you around. Okay. In my, in my video feed. But I can't speak too much of what I do for them. Uh, because they, they like their privacy, but um, I lost my train of thought about what I was going to say about oh, my father. Yeah, so he is the nicest. My dad and I have had one fight in 45 years. Unbelievable. So just a idea, right? He's nicest, easiest go. As much as he sounds like a kook, he's really a very cool, down to earth guy. And but when I started photography when I was 15, I remember clearly um, I pull. I gave him 30 original slides from the month. He's like, you know, take all the work you've done this month and pick 30 slides. And I handed him 30 slides, and he took, you know, 10 slides on one side, and he put 20 slides on the other side. He opened his drawer up, pulled a pair of scissors, and went right through 20 slides, destroying them instantly. Whoa. Now, you might feel like this guy is, like, this, the harshest guy in the world. He's not. He really isn't. But he did it once in my life. And I said, because, you know, these are originals. What have you done? Like, what happened? And he's like, those images are not sharp. 
they're out of focus, and they're not well exposed. I don't want to. I don't want to see that. You know, you're you're a, a crafts person, uh, craftsman, whatever, and you need to technically be sound, if not excellent. And then, you know, that won't get in the way of you telling your stories. And that helped as harsh as that was. Um, I also photographed like a little duck, you know, the black and white fellow made a print and he put it on his wall, cigarette in it on a Sharpie, right? So he tried to steer me in a <laughs> passive aggressive way. And that, tough that duck, love. Very tough love. But, you know, I became, for better or for worse, a very technical photographer yeah. early on. You know, I had no motion blur in my images. You know, that was a, a mistake. Whereas now I love motion blur, you know, but it took me years to get over that. But that helped my career along in that I was shooting for time in Newsweek when I was 17, 18 years old. Because, you know, whether or not my images were great or not, they were very technically sound. So they made a lot of double trucks and covers because they were tack sharp, mm. full frame, perfectly composed. You know, and that brings me, I don't think I have that much sports on here. I don't remember. I don't look at my website that often. Uh, maybe under photojournalism, you might find some. But uh, yeah, there it is. Um, all the frames you see here are shot full frame in camera. There's no cropping. And mm -hmm. that went to my, my first job out of college. You know, first I photographed for the wire services for AFP and Reuters. I photographed Michael J Jordan's last five seasons. But oh. um, well, I w they went to work for a place called All Sport, which became Getty Images. And there was this editor there called Daryl Ingham. And you, you were shooting on Chrome. So imagine any of these images yeah. shot on transparency film. So if you're one stop overexposed, it's unusable or under. It has to, The exposure has to be dead on. Um, and this is before digital, right? So you have to actually use light meter and make calculations. Yeah. Uh, also, they don't crop Chrome. So you're either capturing in camera on the 24 by 36 millimeter um, slide and if you have to crop more than 5% if at all, they would throw it out, literally, just like in the bin. Yeah. And I remember, you know, having this really, really good image, but it was a little loose. And Daryl said, it's not quite there, mate. It's just not quite there. And he flew the <laughs> slide across the room and it floated into the bin. And it's like, you know, you spent your whole weekend, you know, flying from L.A. to the Midwest to shoot, you know, a college game in, in Michigan that Saturday, and then you jumped on a plane to go shoot an NFL game that Sunday, and then you took the you know a 6 a.m. flight or a last flight available to get back to LA to process your film by Monday. You get the idea. Yeah. So you're utterly exhausted come Monday night, and you got this guy telling you, "It's just not quite there, mate." It's in the bin. And you just want to pull your hair out, but that taught you the discipline to say, "All right, if I'm debating between a 400 millimeter or a 500 millimeter, I'm going to go to the 500 mil." Even yeah. though my chances are 300 mil to 500, my chance like that frame right there is it's full frame, and you can see the bubble coming. If you can't see it on this screen, there's actually a bubble of spit coming off his his uh, lips. Oh yes. And um, you know, you don't get that until you push yourself. Now I'm not saying that tight is always right, but that is one of my rules. You know, when in doubt, go tight. So go tight. one lens tighter, or go two lenses tighter. Don't widen out unless it really adds to your story. You know, um, I tell people to treat the frame like it's um, on your wall in a frame. And you have to include stuff that adds to the image, and you have to exclude everything that distracts from it. You know, and uh, you got to do that in camera, not in post. Well, you know, I think this is from the film days. As you said, we had to crop in the camera, and I think it's still really, really good advice to do all your cropping in your camera. And your best friends are your feet, right? You got to move. Yes. You can't just stand in one place. Well, this image right now, this Olympic, this was the, the, the gold medal uh, winning um, flip. I don't know what the technical term is. But wow. that is composed. So with my feet moving inches up and down in the press rows oh, to man. find that angle. You know, obviously I'm going to track them left or right. But I was very keenly focused on not having any desks on the top left, any photographers or coaches on the left or the right, yeah. and shooting extremely tight. Like you have, what, this is not cropped, so you can imagine when they're standing, you're too tight, right? When they're horizontal, you might be a little bit loose. So yeah. you're making a concerted effort to capture something very specific. And what I love about this image is, 
you can't tell whose limbs are whose or yeah. what body is which. And when he touches his head down there, that's it. He's lost the gold medal. So there's a lot involved oh. in the moment that he touches that head down. That's it. He's done. He's, he's lost the gold medal. So, oh, that's amazing. Uh, you know, things like that are, are very, that's what I love about photography is it, it can get very specific in terms of what you're looking for, especially with remote cameras or sports, anything really. Amazing. Well, listen, this has been phenomenal. We're going to take one or two questions if you guys want to pop something in there. I have a question for you while you guys are doing this. is your chance. Ask them anything you want. When you got into using the 5D, had you already been a filmmaker or is this your first entry? That was the first thing I ever shot. So I'd been on film sets. I was a big film buff, but I never shot, you know, rolled 30 seconds of video prior to Reverie. Um, and more than anything, I, I, I respected my limitations. I didn't have a dolly, I didn't have a steady cam, I didn't have a tripod. I had one tripod with a fluid head, but you know, I really understood my limitations and uh, went with that. I mean, and that then, was a pretty bold entry because you didn't just, you know, you, you kind of hit it out of the box, let's face it. I did, but I did it by having fun with friends. There was three of us in a car with two models and we didn't have any client or anything we just went out and shot stuff you know so this stuff here is shot full frame etc on an iphone right from a helicopter oh wow um, so all this stuff that you're seeing is shot off like a prototype iphone for like a keynote launch of i think it said what it was it might have been the iphone 6 or whatever so you have to be very concerted in what you're doing with an iphone right um that's also you know that has one lens and then Lorraine, also, I saw a comment that really got my interest because I never thought about how film and pictures have to literally take, carry taken from point A to point B. We used to have, you know, motorcycles. So a professional a profession was to be a motorcycle um, messenger in Paris or New York that would go pick up films from press photographers and drive them as quickly as possible from one side of Paris to the, to the lab or across the country. We used to find people before 9-11 that we call pigeons that we would hand our film to and they would take the film with them on their flight and when they landed there'd be a motorcycle guy or someone to grab the film to bring the Perry match or whatever yeah. uh, that was a very big deal back in the day before digital uh, so yeah there's there's a lot of history there that's very interesting amazing well you oh, listen you've given us the there was literally uh, if you don't know the story it's one of my favorites is yeah pigeons that you'd put rolls of film on their feet in World War II. And really? there's a famous story about one of the pigeons that was meant to go to London that actually went towards Berlin by, I forget the name of the photographer. Uh, you can look it up. And uh, he showed up, you know, with the American troops and saw his images in a German newspaper. And the irony is they actually credited him <laughs> properly in the newspaper. <laughs> So they, when they say, you know, uh, uh, in French, it's a pigeon voyageur, it's a, it's a pigeon. Uh, they literally were pigeons that you'd put on the, on the little anklet, um, a roll of film and send them out, uh, messenger pigeons. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll start that grass. I love that's like history. That. I didn't even suspect. And I'm going to look that up because that's a fascinating story. Look, there's the pigeon. There you go. There's, there's a photo. I found a well, photo. Of... There's the air 1.0. <laughs> and it's even got a camera on it. This yeah, that's that I had... a camera. An, an aerial that's our first drone right there. Okay. Yeah. Well, Vincent, this has been amazing. Is there any kind of final, you've given so many great points or anything you want to leave us with to elevate our photography to the next level? Well, Jared Temper says, for my part, cropping and editing teaches me where I missed it in camera. Then I drive myself to do better next time. That's absolutely right. It can be a journey. Um, and what I would recommend you do is to crop with your feet, as Mark said. So I want you to be focusing to an intensity level that you may not be used to, like obsessive OCD, crazy tunnel focus, like think use the force loop uh, when you're looking through that frame and move. You don't have to move your feet often. It's literally leaning forward, crunching yourself down, extending yourself, leaning the left or the right. Use your feet to find exactly where things line up and feel perfect or move with your feet because you simply cannot correct a lot of stuff in post. And you should not be pressing the shutter until it feels perfect in this frame that you're looking in. Perfect. And once you get it, you move on to the next image. And when you go to your computer, 
You should be doing a little saturation uh, if you want, a little levels for brightness and darkness, maybe some color temperature. If you go to the Air Series, Jared, Project Air, and you go down to New York, uh, these are all, any, yeah, New York is fine. Uh, all of these images, those are full frame images from, you know, a moving helicopter. There's yeah. no, and there's nothing done other than the saturation and color temperature of these images. They're straight out of the camera. People look at it, how much Photoshop do you do? And my answer is 20 seconds of, you know, lift and stamp. Um, so that's discipline. That's for me, yeah. that what makes me happy to have captured it like that. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you once again for joining us. We'll have to make it back, uh, sooner than nine years from now, because you've got yes. a lot to tell us. And, uh, once again, it's a pleasure having you on the show. You've taught us a lot. In fact, this is, you guys, we're going to take this apart and really work on it because you've given us a lot of really practical, you know, steps to take, not just uh, theoretical stuff. Literally steps. I love that about just moving until, and don't press the shutter until it's absolutely right. Thank you again, Vincent. My pleasure. We'll, Thanks, guys. We'll, we'll be in touch. And you guys, that was a full meal. You can digest this over the weekend. You can practice it. Go out and make photographs that you've never made before. Break some rules. I'm not going to advise you to go steal something and put it back. But, <clears throat> you know, in any other capacity, maybe you can just think, what have I never done before? What have I never played around with and tested? And try that. But also, it's about knowing exactly what you're doing with that camera. Knowing it, as he said, you've got to know what you're doing before you start bending and breaking things. But don't be afraid to experiment. This has been really inspirational. So a couple of things before we wrap up. Uh, thank you guys who have taken this survey on participation. Super helpful. If you haven't taken it, will you please do so? Jared will put the link in there. Um, you know, it's about being involved and participating and that's what AYP is all about so you know if you don't want to do that that's fine but if you do we've got something for you to do that will help us and help your other friends in this community help me help you um, I don't think there's anything else right now we got a new show we're gonna try out I believe on Wednesday which is photography news. We're going to actually bring you news about things that are happening. Like for instance, Hasselblad released or just announced a new digital back. Um, it's coming out later in the month that I'm pretty excited about because it will fit on my Hasi. And anyway, we're going to talk about different things. People we've interviewed, guests, their news, anything that you guys come across that's news, definitely let us know. That's going to be on Wednesday. Um, Jared, anything else? Did I leave anything out? No, I think that's pretty much that. Um, I know it. that we didn't quite get to some of the videos we had talked about doing on uh, Monday, but definitely still send your photos up on AYP Club. We yeah. will do a critique episode soon. We'll uh, fill things that in. didn't quite work out this week, but we that's something we really want to do. Absolutely. Um, and like Mark said, if you've got news, uh, shoot it. My way, I'm going to be compiling, you know, a list of news articles. So if there's something that you see that catches your eye, um, let us know. Even if we have it on our list of things that have happened, that means you're interested in hearing about it and other people might be too. That's right. Okay. Well, listen, you guys, thanks for joining. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already done that. Leave your comments. I read every one of them. I usually respond to them all. Share and last but not least say this with me remember to get out and capture your own images of life take care you guys love you stay safe stay well